touch the sacred book here. <laughs> Trouble for that. Oh, man. Well, my name is Rich. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, sure, and just I'm so grateful that you guys invited me to the party. Um, you've been doing this for 50 years without me. And the thing is, is that y'all could stay sober without me. And I can't stay sober without you. And my sponsor always likes to remind me of that. And keeping anything going in Alcoholics Anonymous for 50 years is a big deal. Uh, so round of applause to the committee and everybody for keeping it going. And the countdown touched me, especially tonight. Um, God does this thing for me. I hope he does it for you as I come up on an anniversary each year. I can feel the feelings of where I was 19 years ago. My sobriety date is August the 30th of 04. Today's the 27th. I was circling the drain on today's date. I was released from the Worcester County Detention Center on a cocaine charge. I went into my homeless shelter, Dia Kenia. Uh, I was no longer welcome in my mother's house. I have one little sister. She hadn't spoken to me in six and a half years. I had warrants in Maryland, Colorado, and California. I'd been kicked out halfway through my senior year with a 3.8 GPA average from the University of San Diego, a Jesuit school. My aunt and uncle hadn't spoken to me in about five years because they have three daughters that are my goddaughters that I continually let down year after year after year at Christmas time. I was 29 coming on 30 years old and I felt like I was 100 years old. And if I, this feeling, I mean, there's, I know you guys know what I'm talking about, that there was just too much water over the dam. Like you, there, there's just no coming back from, from where I am. Uh, but other than that, things were good. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know how you end up there with that, with that set of feelings, um, other than one drink at a time so slowly that we don't know that it's happening. Right? That's the baffling feature of alcoholism. If I go, hey, every bit of morality and integrity and everything wonderful that your wonderful parents taught you, which I had, I came from a little horse farm outside of Baltimore, Maryland, a mother and father that loved me to pieces, but I couldn't feel it. And I don't know what that's all about. I know that was, I'm, a, I'm a hard dude to love, right? You got to love me just right for me to feel it. You got to say this and do this. And if you don't, right, like, like, God bless a woman trying to like love me, right? Because um, I, I, I just don't feel it. Like love is around me, but for some reason it doesn't penetrate me at that point in my life. And... Um, Nobody in my family drinks. No mother, no father, no aunt, no uncle, no grandparents. Um, so that like threw any genetic theories of alcoholism out the window as far as I was concerned, right? And they just were good, good people. I have that one little sister. She's never had a drink. She's three years younger than me. Her name's Whitney. And I just didn't understand what was happening. And, and, and I love that family. I remember loving life up till third grade. And my parents did this thing in third grade that I was going to hate them for, for the next 20 years. You know what they did? They took me out. And, and, and when I used to tell, it's good that we call these our stories, right? That we're telling our story. Because uh, that, that, that's what it is. I look back, right? And I would have said my parents ripped me out of that public school. They ripped me out and away from all of my friends and where life was good to send me to this private school where I had a 45 minute bus ride with all these rich kids that made fun of me and called me farm boy, redneck, hillbilly, right? What'd you do, give the horses sweet feed this morning, farm boy, right? And they tell you that you're poor. Third graders are good like that, man. They don't pull any punches. They just, you know, you're fat. They go, hey, fatso, right? You're like, whoa, I didn't know I was fat, right? Or whatever it is. And that was when I first found out I was poor, right? Um, I didn't know that. I'm not even sure that it's true looking back. I think I came from a farm, they came from the city. That's it, right? But I started to feel that thing that Chuck Chamberlain talks about when he says that all alcoholics, we only have one problem, conscious separation. And there's only one solution, right? Conscious contact. That would have been good to know in third grade, <laughs> but I, I, I didn't know that's what was going to happen. And I don't know that you need to hate your parents to be an alcoholic. I, I know that it's pretty common. 
And, um, and now on the flip side of steps four and five, it's good to have a sponsor. It's good to, those steps are a great suggestion. Uh, almost like pulling the cord on a parachute when you jump out of an airplane, right? Just suggest it, but good move. Um, and by the way, the same thing happens, I think, if you don't follow the suggestions from what I've seen, right, as not pulling the cord. It doesn't usually end well. Um, that's a side note, right? And, and, and what happened? I'm at that school. I don't like the school bus. There's a social hierarchy on the school bus where the older kids sit in the back of the bus, the younger kids in the front. I don't know if they do that here. And if you go to the back of the bus, you get beat up by the older kids. Um, and my kid's name, his name was Reed Carter. And Reed's job was just to beat the snot out of me every day for something. And he was good at his job. And there was a girl on the school bus that looked a lot like the women here. I mean, she was just good looking. Her name was Nikki. I didn't know how to talk to Nikki. Nikki. I didn't know how to approach Nikki. I mean, I got nothing. Um, and I also wish I was taking notes because I don't know about anybody else that, you know, what a great weekend of everybody that, that, that stood here. If you'd have told me in third grade, like, hey, dude, one day you're going to end up in Alcoholics Anonymous and you're going to have to give like a full report, I would have taken better notes, right? Uh, I think I was in sixth or seventh grade, but I couldn't swear to it. The older kid said, you want to skip last class and do some drinking. I'd never skipped any class. I'd never done any drinking. And out of my mouth came, you bet, like I do it every day. And, uh, and they're like, well, what, what do you drink? And I said, bourbon. And I don't know where I got bourbon. Um, <laughs> but I wish I could say that because it just sounds kind of badass, right? <laughs> and, and in fact, what those, what those guys had that day was peach schnapps. And everywhere I tell that story, people laugh at me because it's weenie, right? Um, but I now know that it's not what I drank or how often I drank or what it does to me that makes me one of you and lets me be here with you, right? It has nothing to do with what alcohol does to me. It has everything to do with what alcohol does for me. And I'm willing, right? When I look back on that flip side of steps four and five and this whole process, you know, my parents' big crime was loving me and wanting me to have a better education than they ever had a chance to. And I was going to hate them for that for 20 years, right? And on that day, this whole thing starts to get fixed when these kids say, what do you drink? And I say bourbon. And they say, well, we got peach schnapps. And I start slugging this down with the guys and we're passing it around. And the first thing I noticed is like I was standing shoulder to shoulder with the fellas, man, one of. No better, no worse, not younger, not older, nothing, man. One of the boys, Right? And I get on that school bus and this thing came over me. I was just, I, I intuitively knew how to handle this situation with women that used to baffle me, right? And, and I get on, I'm going to sit next to Nikki that day on the school bus. And uh, with a bunch of drinks in me, I just somehow knew how to do this, right? And I get on the school bus and I start walking to the back of the bus where I know I don't belong. And I'm going to sit next to Nikki. And Reed gets up from his bus seat to give me the daily beating. Uh, in his defense, he was not all the way to his feet as he started to get up. I give him everything I got, man. And Reed goes down and out. And he is totally out on the school bus. And I sit down next to Nikki and I'm looking at Nikki. <laughs> right? And she's looking at me, and I'm looking at Nikki. She's looking at me, and the whole school bus is like silent, which I don't know about you guys, man, but I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. It was like long overdue respect, right? Like finally you know who I am, right? And in that silence, man, there was magic, and we got to Nikki's bus stop, and when we got to Nikki's bus stop, she leaned over and she gave me this little kiss that was like half on my lips and half on my cheek. It was different than when my mother and my aunts kissed me. I like felt it in my toes, man. And she got off that bus and I got to my bus stop and went in my house with that mother and father with morality and integrity and they'd have a great house and that are great parents and that nobody drinks and my little sister and I was obviously drunk. And I got sick that night, uh, peach schnapps. I don't. I know we just had dinner, but it's syrupy, way better going one way than the other. A and they leave me in the bathroom to be sick all night. And you know why they do that, right? They're going to teach me a lesson. That was going to become a very common theme in my life from a whole lot of well-meaning people that loved me and cared about me, that just wanted to give me a little friendly nudge down the road of life. Alcoholic of my variety, we don't respond to that very well. In fact, the way that I perceive that, again, on the flip side of the fifth step, having looked at it in paper, in my own handwriting, there has been about eight people 
that really, really, really just wanted the best for me and were trying to help me down the road of life just to give me a little friendly nudge in the right direction, and I never see it that way. I think you're trying to hurt me, you're trying to hold me down, you're trying to tell me how to live my life, you live your life and back off, this is mine. And I don't know what that's all about, I do know the book talks about defiance as one of my primary traits, right? And that, that, that sure fits me. And um, I'm sick all night, I'm grounded forever, um, which is kind of like life without parole for the prison guys that are here. I've been checking out the tats. Um, I'm, I'm a jail guy. We'll get to that. In Maryland, jail is any sentence up to 18 months. If you get more than 18 months, you go to the Department of Corrections. Um, I, I've never done a DOC sentence. I specialize in like 60-day sentences, 90 days, violate probation, go back for six months, do a year, come out, six months, violate probation, go back for 90 days. Right? Meanwhile, I always think I'm winning. Um, I, I'm always telling, you know, my, my, the guys that I'm with, I'm like, hey, they, you know, I beat the possession with intent to distribute. It was a simple possession. I only got six months, man. I'm winning, right? Like I beat the thing, right? And, and when I was going through all this uh, with, with my sponsor, um, and by the way, when you do a fifth step in my um, sponsorship group or line or whatever you guys call it here, right, in, in our lineage of, of doing it, you sit at the table and you have to go to the Maryland State Police and you pay five bucks and they give you a thing called the NCIC. It's your National Criminal Index. You have to get your credit report and you have your written fourth step. And the reason we do that, it's what you think of you, it's what your creditors think of you, and it's what law enforcement nationwide thinks of you, right? And, and there was kind of what I wrote and then there was like reality. Right? Because the problem with my four step, there's always a story, right? On NCIC, it just says possession with intent, not guilty or not guilty. There's no space on those things for a story, right? And there's always a story for people like me. Like this was one big misunderstanding, right? I meant well, it just went wrong. Like, but there's none of that in law enforcement. They just take things very seriously. They overreact to most things. Um, <laughs> I had a, a, another thing with my group of friends at two o'clock, you figured out who paid the bar bill by going out front of the bar. And, I mean, these were your friends, right? And, and the first guy to knock the other one to the ground, that's the guy that paid the bar bill. You were just figuring out the bill. But if police rolled up on that, they call that second degree assault. And they take it like super serious, right? Carries up to 10 years in Maryland. But if it's your friend and stuff, you usually only get six months for a good old fashioned bar fight. Um, Anyways, I, I, I'm going through that on, on the fourth and fifth step and how I've, you know, done 36 of these little local jail sentences, um, but I'm winning. And, and my sponsor said, well, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that you were serving a life sentence. You were just doing it on the installment program, and, and, and you're too stupid to, like, see what was happening, right? I'm like, oh, God. it's good to have a sponsor, right? They see things different. That's the purpose of a sponsor. But going back to that bathroom, I woke up, right, in sixth or seventh grade, sick as I've ever been, and I was grounded forever, which is the prison guy equivalent of life without parole. Like, you don't know when that's going to end, right? There's, there's no end in sight. And under that set of conditions, as sick as I had ever been up to that point in life and grounded forever, the thought goes through my, you know, head, are you ever going to do any more of that drinking? just that fast. You bet I am. Are you kidding me? Sick as a dog and grounded forever, right? What a small price to pay for what I had going on on that school bus and knock and read out and that long overdue silence and that kiss on the lip, man. And I was look, going to look for that right up to August 27th of 2004, which would have been today's date, right? When I go into that homeless shelter and got out of that last jail cell and was completely unemployable by anybody that ran a background check and had no idea which way to go or what was going on and had destroyed every meaningful relationship in my life. And, uh, and I hated AA, I've been to AA a lot. The, the judges might like to send you there and people that love you like to send you there. And I had this woman in my area named Janine who always carried, uh, oh, this was confusing for me growing up, in case there's any pseudo-intellectuals here. Um, I've never gotten a B, and I've never gotten a B um, 
Not because of what you're thinking, right? Or I want you to think like, oh, that guy's smart. That's what I thought, right? It turns out I'm not very smart, right? We just determined that I've been to jail 36 times and think I'm winning, right? What happened, I know in step six and seven, God, not me, gave me this thing where if I read a book, I remember what's in it. I could usually tell you which page. I'm not fully photographic. You have to be able to say what line. But I could say, oh, that's page 27, you know, about halfway down the page, right? I'm a joy to have in your home group, right? <laughs> uh, right? Oh, no, that would be page 67, sir. You've got that wrong, right? Like, shut up, Rich, right? <laughs> shut up. Nobody cares, right? But it turns out that what I could do is go in the library, right? I don't buy the books in college because that's money you could use for other things, right? But I go in the library and I get the textbook the night before and I read it and then I go in and take the test and I vomit all the information back out and they give you an A and then they put Latin words on it, right? And they parade you across the stage at graduation and they say, here, you know, cum laude, summa cum laude. And everybody claps and they put a blue thing around you and then you give a little valedictorian speech. And what I relate to is when Bill Wilson says, I was seemingly winning at the game of life. Seemingly winning at the game of life. And I picked a college, I picked that college, University of San Diego, I'm a surfer. Um, it's my fa I don't remember learning. My dad taught me to surf. It would be like me asking you, like, tell me your experience learning to walk, right? You're like, I don't know. Just been doing it my whole life, right? And I got into a lot better schools, and we had, you know, these things called uh, academic advisors and, like, college counselors that are supposed to, like, help you pick the best school you could go to. And they had all kinds of suggestions for me, but I knew better. I picked the University of San Diego because it was 3,000 miles away from those good parents with that morality and that integrity and those values, and there was surfing, and there was beautiful women, and that was how I made my college decision. Other people, I had another scholarship uh, to a school in New Jersey called Princeton that my parents wanted me to go to, right? And I'm thinking, like, don't you guys know anything? You know who wants to go to Princeton? Nobody, right? Like, it's in New Jersey. People run away from New Jersey. The only people that you meet used to live in New Jersey, right? They're all trying to get the hell out of New Jersey, right? Who would volunteer? Like, are you not listening to what's going on here? I got into San Diego. There's waves. There's girls, right? And they're like, you're an idiot, right? But I know better, and that's how I live my life, right? And, and off I go. I overlooked the fact that it was a Jesuit college. I didn't even know what Jesuits were. I didn't care. I should have looked into that, right? And... Um, I get into all other kind of stuff out there because in, in Southern California, one of the other things that we're good at as alcoholics, most of us anyways, is kind of figuring out the deal, right? Like what's going on in this area, right? If, if I threw you guys into Maryland, you'd figure out that like you better get good at lacrosse if you want to get some women in high school, right? You better get, you, you better figure out football, lacrosse, soccer, right? We're going to be eating some steamed crabs and you're going to have keg parties and cornfields when you're underage, right? And you got to get that together. And, and ideally, you want to be driving a CJ7 Jeep with no doors or roof when you're in high school because that is bad, right? And, uh, and meanwhile, if you drop me in the middle of a Grateful Dead concert, I'm going to have on patchouli and a tie-dye, and we're going to be noodling, right? And that if you could throw me, right, you could pull me out of that Grateful Dead concert and throw me into a Dead Kennedys concert with my skateboard friends back when I had a mohawk, and I'm going to be stage diving, and, right, I'm in the mosh pit, and we're kicking, right? And, uh, you know, and then I'm a hippie the next weekend at the Grateful Dead, con right? And we could just kind of do that, right? You just, wherever we are, we could figure it out and how to fit in and be what it is. And, and I was good at that. And in Southern California, it seemed to me that the guys that had the stuff were getting the hot chicks. And um, I put that together, like, all by myself. No, no, no woman had ever said, like, dude, you're disgusting, like, you're ugly, you're, you're you know, whatever. I just, I had this inward knowing that I wasn't good enough for you. That as is, you would never want anything to do with me. If I was going to take you out on a date, I was going to have to have a nice car. I was going to have to have flowers. There was going to be a nice restaurant. It was going to have to be first class, or you weren't going to want anything to do with me. And I don't know why I felt that way. Just was never good enough as is. And I don't know that that's what makes me alcoholic, but I know that alcohol fixed it. 
I know that that set of feelings went right away, somewhere around drink five. And, uh, and I'm out in San Diego, and I'm pursuing, again, it blows my mind to think that an old dude that wrote a book that was published in 1939 had every single feeling and experience that I had, right? Remember when uh, Bill went to work on that farm, and there's a line in Bill's story where he's doing farm work, and, and it says, this would be the last day, honest day of honest or Last day of honest hard labor I would ever do, the exciting lore and maelstrom of Wall Street was on, right? He was sucked into the quick buck, man, the shucking and jiving of Wall Street, right? And there's three other guys on a soccer scholarship at the University of San Diego, and they're from Tijuana, Mexico, which is about 29 miles south. And they know how to get all this green stuff that the rich kids at the you know, like smoking, right? And, uh, and when you're on scholarship, you stick with the other kids that are on scholarship, right? Because water seeks its own level, right? Like we're the poor kids hanging together. And, uh, and I'm not sure we were, but we kind of made up that story, right? And, uh, and we're hanging together because we're all on scholarship, you know, and us poor people, right? My sponsor suggested like, you know, there's another way of looking at how you got to go to college. It could be because you had straight A's and were a good soccer player. You weren't like a charity poverty case, but I know you like to tell yourself these stories, right? And I'm like, eh, I guess you could look at it like that, right? That would be another way of looking at it. Um, but I never did, right? And, um, and I don't know, I mean, right? And the older we get and the longer we're sober, the nicer my parents get. Like, all they did was love me and want the best for me. And I had all these stories in my head about my parents and they're screwing me and trying to tell me how to live my life and blah, blah, blah. And I come from a dysfunctional family. I didn't come from a dysfunctional family. I came from a lovely family. The only thing that was dysfunctional was me, right? If, if, if their family had any problems, you're looking at it. And so I'm halfway through my senior year. I got in with these guys to bring in this stuff in, into the United States and my, my life was getting complicated because I'm going to Jesuit classes. I got, it, when you play a division one sport, you have morning and evening practice. You got to eat with the team. Um, the, the stuff's coming up from Mexico. I got to shrink wrap it and get that to the mail to get across the country. Uh, I didn't want you guys or any other state back here to be left out. And, uh, and, and, and then I go to practice and then I got to drink a lot to fall asleep because if your life was as complicated as mine, you'd need to drink a little bit too to fall asleep. And these are the stories I'm telling myself but when I read this book, right, it tells me that often the alcoholic lives a double life. And if I'd have only had two going on, that would have been pretty good. Right? But it turns out that if my mother talked to my little sister, there's going to be some trouble because I had different stories going about what classes I was taking and what I was doing. If my teachers, you know, talked to the registrar's office about what classes I was really supposed to be in trouble, right? If my coach talked to my teachers, trouble. If my girlfriend talked to my other girlfriend, big trouble, right? And there's, you, you got a lot going on when you're living life like that, that you got to keep track of and, and, and live. A lot to, lot to keep going. Um, I own my first house, um, 423 Nautilus Street in a place called La Jolla, California. It's one of the most beautiful communities in the world. Uh, it's by the best wave that there is in Southern California. It's called Wind and Sea. Uh, I was the third house on the right. The people I worked for um, gave me the cash to buy it. Um, none of it was <laughs> legally, <laughs> legally earned. Um, I, I didn't have a fleeting acquaintance with like a hard day's work for an honest day's pay. Like that was, that was for suckers. Right, like that couldn't figure out how to really do life, you know. You squares that like go to work and file taxes and Jesus, losers, right? Um, but I also don't surf anymore at this point in my life. I'm as far from here to the back of the room from one of the best waves in the world, and I don't surf anymore because when you drink like I drink, everything must go. Everything that brings me any form of internal joy and happiness, right? It just sucks it out of me. And I don't know, I'm turning it over. It happens really slow, just like recovery, right? One drink at a time, I'm giving it up. And I don't know that I am. And our book says that by the time the alcoholic, that's me, right, figures it out that I've often slipped past the point of human aid. You know, when did that happen? Oh. Right? Like we're looking back, trying to figure out which day did I slip into alcoholism, right? I don't know. I know my sobriety date, August 30, 04, but you know what date I don't know that I'd be more interested in? 
that first day where I was somewhere in the steps and I forgot to think about drinking for an entire day. I mean, that's the most miraculous day, right? Where the day that the obsession was removed. I wish I knew that date, right? Like, here's my sobriety date, and then I was busy in the steps, and I was so busy in the steps and helping people and doing what my sponsor says that I actually forgot to think about drinking. That's amazing, right? I didn't know. Um, I'm, I'm dating. Oh, I'm driving a BMW. Uh, it's a convertible. It's got a number on the back for you Beamer people that, that lets you know that they don't sell this one in the United States. It's one of the European ones I had to have imported because I'm very important, and you need to know that. And, um, and the number tells you that. That's why people have these cars. Um, I'm dating a girl that was like everybody thought was the prettiest girl at the college. I, I'm still not sure if I liked her, um, but I dated her for you, right? That's how I'm living my life, is to impress people I don't, I don't even know. I have no idea what kind of relationship we have. I barely remember. I know that it was 4.30 in the morning, and I'm halfway through my senior year, and I'm coming up on graduation, and I have a 3.8, and boom, 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 every single door and window come in, and I'm on my stomach, and they're putting on the DEAs, putting on those plastic zip ties, and there's probably some people that have had the zip ties uh, before they're worse than handcuffs. And off I go to the Metropolitan Correction Center, they call it MCC, it's the Federal Penitentiary in downtown San Diego. San Diego Union Tribune and the Los Angeles Times run a headline that says, Jesuit student, 27 kilos of cocaine. Uh, there's a thing called the Federal Sentencing Guidelines for Chances are somebody's done some federal time. They look at your number of previous arrests, and it turns out all those little weenie arrests that I had, you know, there isn't a person in here that would be impressed, right? Especially the prison guy. You would not look at my NCIC and go, that is a badass. You would look at it and go, dude, you're an alcoholic idiot, right? It, sh it should just say drunk and stupid, right? It's like mostly like drunk in public, drunk in public, urinating in public, trespassing, like they asked me to leave the bar and I come back, right? Trespassing, trespassing, <laughs> trespassing. Um, I, I've got a lot in Maryland. We have a crime. It's punishable by up to 90 days of jail. Failure to obey the lawful command of a police officer. That's what they just say, like, you know, ma'am, please be quiet and go back inside the bar. And all I have to do is say, okay, but I can't. Right? When I got about 10 drinks in me, I'm like, no, nah! right? And oh, the next thing you know, it's a fight, and then it's an assault, and like, I just can't comply, right? Um, anyway, so now they look at my 36 weenie arrests and the 27 kilos of cocaine, and a federal judge can't do whatever they want. They have to doing these federal sentencing guidelines, and mine were 46 to 60 years, and that represented a substantial commitment, right? Like, I'm not even a prison guy. Like, I don't like that kind of commitment. Like, I don't really like any commitments, right? And that got my attention, and an interesting thing, I wasn't given any bond. A U.S. attorney stood up and said that if Mr. Bruckner's given any bond whatsoever, all of his business partners reside in Mexico. He will flee to Mexico, where he will live a happy and successful life. That also got my attention, because I hadn't had a happy and successful life on this beautiful little horse farm in Maryland with wonderful parents. I hadn't had a happy and successful life at a wonderful private high school, one of the best in the country. Hadn't had a happy and successful life in La Jolla, California. Hadn't had a happy and successful life living right next to the beach. Like, what is this guy talking about, right? But judges buy that stuff, right? I don't do well. To this day, I got a little sticking point with, like, cops and judges, they just don't understand our people very well, right? And uh, he says no bond, he believes them, right? That's gonna happen, I'm thinking if I go to, I'm dead is what I am, right? If I go to Mexico, I'm dead. Um, but anyway, so I'm held without bond. I was telling my new friend last night, the, the only great, well, I got a couple great experiences, but <clears throat> the non-spiritual great experience, they had a ping pong table and because of the people I was with, um, if I went swimming, there's probably a person or two here who I've been, I have a big scar across my stomach. I've been stabbed in Mexico. I've been beat up more times than I'm, I'm a big fighter. I'm not a big winner. Um, I've got a lot of, <laughs> lot of scars from, from fights and stuff. And you could like hold me down and beat me up and all that kind of stuff and s stab me. None of that seems to really capture my attention. Um, they, they, 
when I first started working for the, guy, for the guys in Mexico, they kidnapped me and took me down there. I think it's supposed to like scare you and initiate you. They held me down and branded a, a M into my shoulder to remind me who owns me and who I work for. Um, but that little M, when I got to the federal penitentiary, um, I got to play ping pong whenever I wanted. Nobody messed with me. They had a ping pong table and I got to play ping pong because they're like, don't mess, he's with them, right? And uh, I have a really good ping pong day. To this day, I got a good ping pong game. Um, normal people are probably not proud of that, but you know, that's... <laughs> Just so you know where I'm coming from, right? Like, I'm not quite right. But more substantially, the thing that happened in there of much greater value and weight is for the very first time in my life, that facility holds roughly 1,300 men, I think. There was 1,299 of those men were innocent. And I know that because that's what they told me every day. In the yard, that's what they told me. And they told me why they were innocent. And they told me things like, I'm in here because of my mechanic. And if that mechanic had fixed the taillight on my car, that cop would have never pulled me over. And if the cop hadn't pulled me over, he wouldn't have smelled the alcohol on my breath, asked me to step out of the car, searched the trunk, found the two kilos of meth. And when I get out of here, if I find that mechanic, we're going to get this straightened out. And if you hook that person up, to a lie detector test, they believe that they're sitting in federal prison because of their mechanic, right? Not that if you like suggest a little reality, like, hey, well, if you're gonna haul two kilos of meth, how about if you don't drink first? You think that could have, at the very least, do you think like you wanna be drunk while you're doing a crime like that? Like, how about not drinking? Could, could we agree that maybe drinking might have, not, no, it's the mechanic. Right? And anyways, I listened to these stupid stories, right? Like, the, the, the reason I'm in here, if she hadn't cheated on me, I wouldn't have had to stab her, and da, 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 right? And that person, like, believes it, right? And, and I'm just sitting there thinking, and now what I know that the higher power did was surrounded me with enough of me that I was able to see me for the very first time. And I realized that I was right where I was because of how I live. Right? And I was where I was because of who I was. And I was who I was because of how I live. That was a huge awakening for me. I'm going to say it again. I was where I was because of who I was. And I was who I was because of how I live. Another way of saying that is I am nothing but the sum total of my actions. My tombstone is not going to say, here lies Rich Bruckner, he meant well. Right? And I bet most of us, I don't ever remember a Friday night. I don't know about you guys, do, do, do you ever do any pre-game, we call it pre-game drinking in Maryland, where you're drinking to get ready to go drinking, right? It's Friday night, you're in the shower, you're on like your third drink, man, that beer's sitting on the ledge of the shower in a hot shower, and it's dripping down, and man, it feels good, and you're getting out of there, I mean, you're getting, and I'll tell you, if you're new and you're trying to figure out if you're in the right spot, if you drink to get ready to go out drinking, we welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous, right? <laughs> like, that isn't normal in and of itself, but... I would get out of the shower on Friday night after my pregame drink it and I'm getting dressed because I'm coming out to meet some of you ladies. I mean, it's an optimistic moment in the pregame drinking, right? You're, get, you're getting dressed. You only got three or four in. I mean, it's going to be a good night. And I put it on. I spray it on a little girl sauce maybe. It's going to be special tonight, baby. And, uh, and if Phil calls, and goes, hey, Rich, what are you up to tonight? Well, Phil, tonight I'm going to, you know, head out to the Whiskey Go-Go and, uh, Los Angeles, and I'm going to get so drunk that I get arrested. It's going to be in the paper, and it's going to break my mother's heart, and she's not going to be able to look at her only son for about a decade in the eye. Uh, do you have any plans tonight? <laughs> you know, you know, Matt calls. Hey, Rich, what are you up to tonight? Uh, tonight, I think I'm going to get so drunk that I make some ignorant comments to my little sister's best friend and embarrass the heck out of her, and she doesn't speak to me for six and a half years. What are you up to tonight, man? I never meant for either of those things to happen. They both did. Those are both real stories. I never meant for them to happen. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, we operate on the same principles, right? This is a program of action. Nobody in AA has ever asked me, how do you feel about our steps? Right? Nobody's ever said, you know, are they pleasing to you? Do you, do, do, do you think they're well written? Do you have any updates for the book? Nobody's ever asked me of that, right? 
but what you all care very much about is what I do. Right? Nobody cares about what I think or say or intend. Uh, we all carry the AA message, right? And when absolutely necessary, we use our mouth. What I'm doing tonight is like the least potent form of AA. In fact, my home group could care less. In fact, they make fun of the fact that I'm here, right? But if I'm not there Tuesday making coffee, there's going to be trouble, right? Like that's what they care about. They care about that Thursday night that my sponsor and I have sat side by side each and every Thursday for 17 and a half years leading a big book study. They just watch that, right? They watch that, the actions. Is the coffee made? Are you there an hour early? Were you at the door? Where were you? What did you do, right? Not what you're saying, right? The fact that I'm here, they're like, oh, where are you going this weekend, Mr. Speaker? Right? Oh, Indiana, 50th anniversary celebration. Big time. Big time. Where do you go next month? Tampa? Oh, Mr. Speaker. Right? Like, they make fun of this stuff, but they like their coffee. Right? And uh, it's our actions, right, at Alcoholics Anonymous. There's no chapter into feeling, into understanding. We don't care if you with, but we care very much what you do. I learned that in federal prison, that I was where I was because I am nothing but the sum total of my actions. And that something was going to have to change inwardly, right? And when I came out of there, I bounced around, and I want to get, uh, I want to get sober here. So I'll, I'm going to just sum it up quick. And the, I couldn't go back east because I had shamed my family, and I couldn't face them. My ego would not allow that. It would not allow me to face the music. I had embarrassed my, my mother. Um, to no end. My sister was done with me. There's just a lot of reasons. I couldn't stay in San Diego. There was, they, they, I lost 27 kilos of product. They, they were looking. Um, I, I start bouncing around the country. I went to a town called Steamboat, Colorado. Uh, I take alcoholic jobs. Alcoholic jobs are where you can show up around 4 o'clock. For me, they were usually in the bar and restaurant business, right? You can drink on the job. It's rewarded. You get a certain amount of free drinks each night. You could be Right, that, that kind of need to explain it to you guys. You all had alcoholic jobs, right? It's where alcohol dictates what I do. And I think I'm choosing, because I'm a little, right? Oh, I just like bartending. Right? Oh, okay, right? And uh, in Steve, I'm a warrant drinker, right? Which means that when I drink in the same town for long enough, eventually I get a warrant. It's one of the side effects of my drinking. And tough guys, face the fire. They walk through the fire. You guys have shown me that and taught me that. Now, Alcoholics, I don't do that. I'm a runner. I want you to think I'm a badass, a tough guy, right? But I'm a runner. And when there's a warrant, I go to the next town. I went from Steamboat, Colorado uh, to a town called Jackson, Wyoming. I love Jackson. They, Jackson, Wyoming is one of my favorite bars. It's called the Million Dollar Cowboy Bar. Anybody been to the Million Dollar Cowboy Bar? Uh, I love when one or two people have, so they could back me up on this. At the Million Dollar Cowboy Bar, okay, the bar stools are real saddles that they have welded to metal poles that go into the ground. And right, let me tell you this, when you get up in that saddle at the bar, there is this feeling of ease and comfort. I mean, you are in the you're in for a night of drinking, baby, right? And I get that money up on the bar, right? So you can, you can see who has arrived and I get that money up there and Chris looks at me and that pile of money and I go, let me buy you one, babe. And she says, what's your story, cowboy? And I go, I'm traveling, babe, just traveling. Like I'm some type of romantic sojourner across our great nation. Like I am running from a warrant. I had a state warrant in California. I have a warrant in Colorado and I'm so delusional. I think I'm on like the great American journey, right? And, and eventually I, I go from Jackson, Wyoming because there's warrants to a town called Ketchum, Idaho. Um, and, and I wind up eventually where every big shot wannabe drug dealer winds up when the federal government seizes every bank account, every house, every car, when alcoholism owns you lock, stock, and barrel. You know where I end up? Mom's couch, right? <laughs> and uh, any mom's couch people? Yeah, yeah. So you guys know, right? There's only one rule at mom's couch. Rich, you're welcome back here for as long as you need to be here, as long as Oh, there was more Willam's Couch people than let on. Now you rat it yourselves out. <laughs> yeah, that was shameless, right? You know the rule. You're welcome as long as you want, as long as you don't drink. I made it two and a half weeks on a firm resolution. I couldn't even believe that that woman took me back into her house. 
Um, I'm coming in and out of AA. I don't like this one woman in AA in particular. Her name's Janine. I don't like Janine because she's always got the stupid big book with her. She's like 16 years sober when I made her. I don't really understand AA or anything. All I know is when I read a book, I remember it, right? And you got 16 years sober. Why you got the book with you? Are you like in the slow class? You can't remember things. What's right? Like, why, why are you carrying that into every meeting? Like, have you not read it? I mean, 16 years, you should have read the thing by now, right? And uh, like, what is, what is your problem? And, and, and she doesn't call, in, in our area, like we call them sponsees when you sponsor somebody. The old timers call them pigeons. Janine doesn't call them either of those. She calls them duckies, right? Which I find repulsive, right? And when Janine comes into the meeting, right, it's always Janine, and she's got about six or seven of these little duckies in back of her, right? And, and, and they got their stupid books, the, you know, and their smile, right? And, uh, and Janine sits down, and then dish, 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 the little duckies, like, file in. And uh, it's disgusting, right? You, you want to throw up right now. That's, that's the way I was, right? And, and then we do this thing in Maryland where you get, does anybody have 30 days? So we got these little color chips. Do you guys have the color chips? All right, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, right? Does anybody have 30 days? And little Rebecca would come like bounding up to the front of the room. She's like, my name's Rebecca and Janine's my sponsor and I'm on step four. I think I'm getting free. I'm going to do my fifth step this Saturday, right? And I'm in the back of the room where you're supposed to be when you're new. You know, I wear a hat in the meeting because I don't even know to like not wear a hat in a church at that point. You got to, because I'm cool, right? And you got to have that down and you got to be pissed when you just get out of jail. And I'm in the back where, you're, you know, the pissed guy's sitting there and I'm looking and, and she's up there. And you know what I'm thinking? I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm thinking I'm going to knock her teeth so far down her throat <laughs> that little Rebecca will never smile again. Right? And then, does anybody have 60 days? Teresa. Oh, my name's Teresa. She needs my sponsor. I'm starting to make amends. I think I'm getting free. Right? And I'm like, I'm going to knock her teeth so far down her throat that she will never smile again. Right? And then we get to the worst part of an AA meeting for, you know, a habitual in and outer, you know, relapsing idiot that just won't do anything you suggest. Right? Does anybody have 24 hours or a desire to start over? And I got to do the longest walk in AA one more time, right? And uh, I eventually make it to 36 days without a drink. I can't go one more day without drink. I don't have a sponsor or anything. I just look at the steps, right? Because I know everything. I'm a good rememberer, right? That's the other thing my sponsor pointed out at six and seven. The thing about reading, he goes, you're not smart. You can remember things. You're a good rememberer. He's like, say that out loud. See how many people you impress, right? He's like, did you go to remembering class? Did you work on your remembering? Like, do you really have anything to do with this? Do you remember going to remembering school? Like, why don't you drop that on people and see if you impress them? Hi, my name's Rich. I'm a good rememberer, right? Like, nobody, he's like, that's the truth, right? Like, tell the truth. <sighs> mm. I look at the steps, in particular step four, and I decide steps are for you guys, right? Like nice people. You probably spilled a little drink, maybe some red wine on that nice white shirt. It embarrassed you at the party. And you came to AA. You've been sober ever since. I can tell just by looking at you, right? You know, he, he came to AA. You know, he came to AA. He had a little, you know, one DUI. He said, you know what? I'm never going to put myself through this embarrassment again. Been sober ever since. You know, A is for nice people that have little screw-ups, right? But this fourth step, if somebody like me writes stuff down in my line of work, that's called a paper trail, right? I've got, I, I, I've got warrants in three states. The IRS is looking for me, and you want me to write stuff down. Like, that's the first no-no of the business I'm in, right? Like, you've lost your mind, right? But the people in AA, the, you know, the nice people, they say things like, oh, it holds the key to the future. And I'm like, yeah, the key to the jail cell, right? Uh, there's only one problem, and it talks about it in the book, that when I'm unwilling to do a fourth and a fifth step, right, I'm going to die. And that's the only timeline. You know, people say, when should, I, when should I do the steps? I don't know, just sometime before you die. Um, no hurry, you know, no hurry, just before you die. Right? <laughs> and I was dying. And I get to 36 days, I won't do any of the, you can't. And... I'd had my liver biopsy. That should be a hint, by the way. At, at 29, if you're in Johns Hopkins Hospital and they're pulling a chunk out of your liver to biopsy it, right, for cirrhosis at that age, 
You might want to look at that, but I, I did. I mean, what, it's Johns Hopkins. What do these people know, right? Uh, I, I get most of my advice from bartenders and drug dealers. Like, they know things. Oh, you're having a bad day? Here's a double. Like, there's a solution right there. You don't want to be seeing a doctor. He, he said that if I stopped drinking, I ate a certain diet, and I didn't take any Tylenol for the next five years, that the liver would probably regenerate at such a young age that Tylenol is the worst thing for your liver. And I didn't know that. I just, at 36 days, I remembered that because I'm a rememberer. And at 36 days, I knew the inside I couldn't take so much as one more drink. I wasn't going back. And I knew I couldn't live one more day without a drink. And our book calls that the jumping off place. And I did what cowards do. I took every bit of Tylenol, everything I could get in the medicine cabinet. My body uh, apparently collapsed in the kitchen. I've learned from the lady that lived next door. When I fell, I fell into a refrigerator. The refrigerator thudded against the wall, which scared the daylights in the lady next door. Because I live in a crappy apartment, right? That's where drunks live. And the walls are like paper thin. And what I didn't know, this lady next door was a weirdo. She hadn't missed a day's work in nine years. Have you ever met these people that are like, I have a perfect attendance record at work. I haven't missed a day's work in nine years. I'm like, well, good for you, right? Um, but she was home sick that day. First time in nine years. Hadn't missed a day's work, but she did that day. And she was home to hear that, and it scared her, and she ran and looked through the window and saw feet on the ground and dialed 911, and I woke up in the Atlantic General Hospital for the fourth time as a result of my alcoholism. And as I came to in one of those sexy paper gowns where your butt hangs out and they're tied up the back, there's things beeping, I got tubes in me, I have that feeling that comes across me where I, you know, I, I, it was clear that I lived. I remember having that thought, like, you lived. You can't even kill yourself the right way, Right? That's a special feeling right there. Just beneath, if there's like a sliding scale of loser, right? Just beneath total loser is reserved for those of us that have tried to kill ourselves and we can't even pull that off right, right? And as I, my eyes clear, and I see what's going on. You know who's at the foot of the bed, right? Janine with about four or five of the duckies. And, and you're laughing, but I wasn't because I was pretty sure if there was a place called alcoholic hell that I was in it, right? And, uh, and Janine didn't talk to me that day. She tried to talk to me many times before that, but she did talk to the duckies. And she said, girls, I want you to take a good look. This is what happens to an alcoholic that refuses to take our steps. Let's go, girls. <laughs> and that was it. That was August 30 of 04, three days from today, 19 years ago. And when I got a sponsor and I started reading this book, and I read about what happened to Bill in that hospital and that bright light came in and the cool breeze blew through and through, I was pissed. Are you kidding me? Bill got a bright light and a wind and I got Janine and the duckies, right? <laughs> I was like, dude, but what I know now is what I got was every bit as significant as what Bill got because the next thought, right, the next thought that went through my head, I've never had one like it before or since. And that thought was that if I get out of here, if I live through this, I'm going to do the one thing I've never done in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to find one of those old guys with that book in their hand and that smile on their face, and I'm going to do every single thing they tell me to do. I don't know where that thought came from. Right? I've never thought like that in my life. And I found a man named, I knew who I was going to. His name was Jim, and I think Jim was excited as I was. Jim had a sponsor. His uh, Jim's sponsor was a man named Clarence Snyder. He had a sponsor by the name of Dr. Bob Smith. Um, I only care about that because I'm a cynic. I don't take anything off face value. Right? You tell me something, you know what I'm going to say to you? Where'd you get that? Right? And Jim would always say things, well, that's why we wrote this book, Rich. We wrote this book. You know why we wrote it? We wrote it for you. Six-day guy. We wrote this book for you. You know why they wrote it? To protect the newcomer from the old-timer. Because the longer we're around here, we get to thinking we know something. We get to adding things, taking things away, having clever little ideas. And Jim would always say to me, Rich, if it isn't in here and I can't back up what I'm showing you, then it is in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was one of the greatest things and the most humble things that that man ever said to me. With 40, he was 48 years sober at that point, right? And I had, you know, if it isn't in here, it isn't AA. And I said, yes, sir. 
And we started going through those, those steps and uh, one through three, man, I got okay with the higher power and four, five, and six, I got some of that stuff down on paper. It became real clear who the problem was, that's for sure, <laughs> right? It was an awful lot of writing to figure out who the problem was. And it was obvious. And I was ready to be done with it, man. The results of my life weren't good. I didn't have much to speak of in terms of meaningful relationships. I just burned it down in all areas. My heart was empty. My soul, we've heard two beautiful talks on soul sickness, man. I was just so empty on the inside. And uh, Jim was getting old and he handed me off to this guy named Roger, who's been my sponsor for the last 17, 18 years. And Roger said, you know, uh, you're on steps eight and nine. And well, I guess I want to tell you this story about Jim because it's funny. In, in Ocean City, we've, we've got lots of different kinds of meetings. Some of them are called discussion meetings, right, where you kind of just get to say anything. And, uh, and I liked those because they were crazy. It was kind of like watching the Jerry Springer show, right? You, you put a dollar in the basket and you just get to hear any old thing. And everybody talked about doing their fifth step at the beach. And you go there and you share it, and you, know, you, you read your fifth step, and you light it on fire with your sponsor, and you throw it into the ocean. And I just felt this utter relief, right? And they tell this, I mean, it's a beautiful story. It's like listening to like a Viking burial or something, right? And I get ready to do my fifth step, and Jim says, good, be at the house at 9 a.m. on Saturday at my dining room table. And I said, well, Jim, I don't know if you, you know this. I go to a lot of meetings, and we're supposed to do this at the beach because I'm going to read it to you at the beach, and we're going to light it on fire and throw it into the water. And he goes, where did you hear that? And, and I said, at the, at the clubhouse, you know, at the, at the AA meeting, the, the noontime, you know, meeting. And he said, bring me the AA schedule and get over here. And I, I took the schedule of meetings, and he started circling the meeting, he said, would you please stop going to BB meetings? And I said, well, what's BB? And, and he goes, I have no idea, but it's not AA. The meetings that I've circled are AA. If you light your fist step on fire and throw it in the ocean, how are you going to do step eight and nine? They're right here. And he opened the book and he said, it shows me. We had a list. We made it when we took inventory. How are you going to do the remaining steps if you light things on fire? Please stop listening to the stuff, right? Like, talk to me talk to me. It's good to have a sponsor, right? I go to the meeting, I hear some stuff, I talk to my sponsor, he squares it up with the book, sets me in the right direction. It was a, a much better plan. So we get up with Roger and I'm about to start this ninth step and he looks at me and he says, kid, how free do you want to be? Alcoholics Anonymous is theoretical up to step nine. You've made some peace with the God of your understanding and steps one through three, good for you, nobody cares. Oh, you've written your fourth step and shared it with a fifth step, good for you. Nobody cares. Oh, step six and seven. You know some of your shortcomings and defects? Good for you. Nobody cares. Oh, you got a list, Rich, of what you're going to make right. You've been going to make right your whole life. Nobody cares. You're an endless series of unfulfilled promises, Rich. You're going to make right. But step nine, step nine is where we get to maybe, just maybe, rub the record clean. Maybe I get to die even with the universe. Maybe I get to pack back into the stream of life what I've taken out of it. How free do you want to be? And something about that man lit me on fire, right? And he said, if I was you, I'd date your mother at least once a week. Anywhere that woman will go with you, you take her. And at the time, I'm, I'm unemployable. Anybody that does a background check, I applied to clean toilets at, at the Home Depot, won't hire me. I can't mop floors at Walmart at the night shift, the cleaning shift, they won't hire me. I won't, I'm not even allowed to drop French fries in the oil at McDonald's, right? Won't hire me. But a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous hired me for $6.25 to sweep the floor in a picture frame shop. And he made these hand-carved wooden picture frames, a guy named Dan. And when I met him, when he hired me, he was 18 years sober. And I would sweep, sweep, sweep the floor. And he would play tapes back then of all these old guys, man. You know, and uh, Cliff Roach and uh, Dave Dobbs and... Clancy and Johnny Harris, and I'm sweep, 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 sweep. And he catches me, Cliff Roach is the old surfer, right? And I'd listen to Cliff. I'm like, play Cliff again, play Cliff again. And I'm sweeping and I'm smiling. And he goes, you better be careful. I saw you laughing. And once you're laughing, we got you, right? And, uh, and I'm starting to like Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to the AA meetings instead of the BB meetings. And something inside me is starting to change. And I'm working my way through the steps. And I'm starting to like people. I did. You ever have that experience when you come today? Like there's people you're kind of scared of and they're weird. And then over time you're like drawn to them. 
right? And the meetings you used to not like, now you like, and the meetings you used to like, now you, you know what all of that is, right? That that's becoming inwardly rearranged, right? We're starting to change from the inside out. And the people around us, our book tells it, because can see it before we can, right? They see AA working in our life before we can. And I'm becoming spiritually reorganized from the inside out. And I'm dating my mom and I'm dating my mom. And I have no idea at $6.25 an hour, I work 40 hours a week and I always had a dollar for your basket and I always had money to take my mom to dinner. And after dating mom and dating mom and dating mom, we were at Carabas one night. Her favorite meal is spaghetti and meatballs. And she twirls spaghetti on one of those big spoons before she puts it in her mouth. I don't know why she does it, but that's what she does. And she's twirling that spaghetti and her eyes came up from that plate of food. And she was looking at me in my eyeballs for the first time in over a decade. And she started to talk to me and was able to look at me. And she started inviting me to her house and said, would you please take out the trash? It's getting heavy for me as she approached her to her early 70s. And she'd say, can you please change that light bulb in my kitchen? And I'd stand on a chair to change a light bulb. It used to take me about a month to sober up enough to change my mom. She has a little townhouse with one light bulb in her kitchen with a little dinette. And I didn't mean to do it, but I would leave that lady in the dark cooking because she would say, can you come change this? I can't see in my kitchen to cook and eat. And I'd say, I'll be right over. And that would take sometimes two, three weeks for me to be right over. But not anymore, right? Not in Alcoholics Anonymous. Mom calls and we show up. And it turns out that when I take esteemable actions, I grow in esteem, right? I always wanted a shortcut. I always wanted to feel good and do bad, right? Like I always wanted to, like how do I get you? You know how you pick your head up and your shoulders come back? By taking esteemable actions. Get out of here. Right? It's that simple. And, uh, and I'm showing up and showing up and showing up. And if she was standing here tonight, she, she would tell you that at uh, eight or nine years sober, I met my wife. Um, and we have two little girls now, eight and five. But we made the decision to build a house about a mile away from my mother so that we could be close as she gets older. And we built her a room at the house with her own bathroom. It's like the grandma suite so that she's in and out of my house probably two, three times a day, playing with her grandbabies, bringing food, making fruit salads, going out front on the beach, watching them learn how to surf. And I call it her throne. It's a Tommy Bahama beach chair. She sits in front of my house on the sand and she watches her grandbabies play with their dad and their mom and learn to surf and stand up and ride those waves and build a sand castle. And she just sits in that chair with a smile of contentment and peace and ease that you all gave her because she knows her little boy is okay. And there's another spiritual book that says, may you see your children's children. And she's getting to do that right there. And my little sister that hadn't talked to me in six and a half years, I had a set of Baltimore Ravens season tickets when I got sober. I don't know why I had them. I think it was from like one last drug deal or something. And, uh, and my sponsor said, send those tickets to your little sister. She lives in Baltimore. She would enjoy those games. You don't even like the NFL now that you're sober. He said, you know what you liked about the NFL? You liked being a big shot in the parking lot. You liked having the biggest and best tailgate in the parking lot. Big bar, big man on campus, slicing a prime rib, making it. He said, you were so drunk by the time the game started, you never knew who won. And that was the truth of me in the NFL. I liked the parking lot more than the game. You know, and sober, it's hard for me to sit down for four hours. I'd rather be doing something with you all. And, uh, but he said, send those to your sister. I said, she hasn't talked to me in six and a half years. These are expensive. Why would I send them? He said, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you, send those to your sister. And I sent them and nothing happened. I said, nothing happened. He said, send the next set for the next week. I said, are you listening to me? These are expensive. He said, send the tickets. And I sent the tickets and the phone rang. And on the other line, this little voice that I hadn't heard in six and a half years go, Richie, Richie, did you see that? The Ravens tied it up. They tied it up. They're in the end zone. I have no idea who they were even playing, man, but I was talking to my little sister for the first time in six and a half years, and I kept sending the tickets, and she kept calling, and we built this little relationship around football. She lived about two hours away from me in a place called Annapolis, Maryland, and on the weekends, I'd work all week for $6.25 an hour, take my mom to dinner on Friday night, and uh, I'd been with you, and then Saturday morning, I'd drive that two hours to help her fix up her new house, and we were painting all the walls together and putting down some hardwood floor and fixing it up, and it was never convenient. I never had enough money to do it. Never fit into my weekend. But you know what? That's what big brothers do. They show up for their little sister. And if you were waiting for a time when I had enough money to do that or it was convenient, you'd have to have somebody else here tonight. And my sponsor tells me that Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of divine inconvenience. 
And if Alcoholics Anonymous is convenient for you and fits nicely into your schedule, you're doing it wrong. A program of divine inconvenience. I had no idea. And that little girl, our relationship grew and grew and grew and grew and grew over the years. And this boy called me, and I knew who he was. And he said, Rich, this is Justin. He said, I know your father's no longer with you, but you've become the number one man in your little sister's life. She looks up to you for everything. I'm calling to ask you if I could have her hand in marriage. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. What kind of big brother I was to ask me. And she called the next day and said, would you walk me down the aisle, big bro? And Alcoholics Anonymous let me do that, sober and in my right mind and dressed appropriately, and my mom wasn't scared I was going to cause a scene, right? What shape is he going to show up in? And uh, time went on. They have two little boys, my nephew, Sadler and Brixton. They're 10 and 9. They were at my house last week. In the summer, I can't get rid of them. All they want to do is come to the beach and stay at my house, right? And now my mom's in that Tommy Bahama beach chair, her throne, the throne of a grandmom, sitting on the beach. And you now want to know what's at her feet? Both of her children and their spouses, all four grandchildren, building sandcastles, learning how to surf, and you're looking at the happiest woman in the world. I had a friend named Ethan. I didn't show up at his wedding. His father sent me a plane ticket um, I, when I was out in San Diego taking over the world, one drug deal at a time. He asked me to be the best man in his wedding, and I love this guy, man. There was nothing I'd have rather done. And he sent me this plane ticket, and I was too drunk to get on the airplane. I didn't call, and I didn't show. And I don't know what you guys do when you do something like that, but I never answer that person's phone call again because I know why they're calling. They're calling to tell me what a no-good bum I am and what a piece of crap, and I am, and I know it. And that's why alcoholics. Uh, we actually have now with technology, it's not in the book, so this is, this is, right? They didn't have it back then, or Bill would have put it in the book, I'm, I'm pretty sure. We have a ninth-step detector, so you know if you're done. It's called caller ID, right? And if you have to look at who's calling you, you're not done your ninth step, right? Because that means you still owe somebody, there's somebody you're not right with, there is some reason that you can't answer the phone. And there are people in this room that know when you call me how I answer the phone. Hello, Rich Bruckner, how can I help you? And it took a long time for me to be able to have that freedom, right? A long time. Um, I had the IRS after me, uh, took me nine years, I'm running out of time, took me nine years to pay back the IRS. Uh, $20 a week. I owed them $46,000. Uh, when I went to put that last check in, I will tell you this, I got free from the IRS, not at the end of my payments. I got free from the IRS after my first check. Because as soon as I made that payment plan and put that first check in the mail, they stopped sending all those letters. They stopped calling. They stopped garnishing my wages. I got free on the first check, not the last, but the last felt damn good. And when we went, my little sponsor, he's 86. At the time, he was I don't know, I guess 79, when I put that last check in the mail, he's got a pacemaker and a defibrillator, he's about five foot tall. We're in the post office in the center of town and it's crowded. He says, put the check in. And I put the check in, he goes, say it out loud, say it out loud. And I go, my amends to the IRS is complete. And I put it in and he jumps over that post office like the box, right? Gives me a high five, I thought he was gonna like give himself a heart attack. I'm like, easy, right? And people are looking at me, and the next year came by and I got this envelope and it was, had stuff in it from the iron and it had a big check. And I start crying. I drive to my sponsor's house and I'm like, I'm in trouble again. Look at this thing. Something came, the IRS, I don't know. And he looks at it and he said, that's a tax refund check, you idiot. Normal people get those every year. <laughs> and I've gotten those every year, year since. I got straight with the IRS. And he told me, you don't have to like paying taxes. You don't have to agree with what they do with your money. And I know you got all kinds of opinions. Again, nobody asks. You just got to pay the taxes, they'll give you some back. I'm like, all right. And he's like, and you, and you don't go to jail and you don't have to worry and you get to be free. The last thing I want to tell you about, and I'm going to shut up, um, in case you can't tell, I love Alcoholics Anonymous and I love God and I don't know the difference. If you told me to write you a little paragraph on the difference, I'd be stuck. I love it, man. And, uh, and I've come a long way to share the joy of this thing with you. And the last thing I had was this old warrant in California. I got a DUI uh, with some outside issues in my pocket, and a judge gave me a five-year sentence. Uh, but he put me in this thing called the PC-1000 First-Time Felony Offenders Program. That was the precursor to drug courts nationwide. California did it before any other court had a drug court. And it was like... The really neat thing about it, it was pre-adjudicative. So if you completed it, you wouldn't even get the felony on your record, right? It was a way of keeping the felony off. And, uh, and you know what I had to do? I had to go to like 10 AA meetings. I had to do some clean urine tests. And I had to like do some community service. What an order. I can't go through with it. Or I had to do five years in prison, right? And 
I'm like, I'll be your number one guy. But what I don't know is that I'm an alcoholic, right? If I am alcoholic, there is nothing you can hang over my head. Five years in prison or stay sober, 10 AA meetings, you know, clean urine tests, right? If I can say, oh, you're threatening me? Five years, I'll just shape up. Wish I could do that, right? It's not up to me. Right? It's just not up to me. I wanted to do that. I would have passed a lie detector test. If he'd have hooked me up and said, are you going to really do this? Yes, I am, Your Honor. Right? And I didn't, and I violated, and when I violate, I run away, and it's years and years and years later. It was a non-extraditable warrant in California. It was the last of my amends, and my sponsor says, hey, You've got two years, I saw you stand up, I'm sorry to pick on you. He goes, you got two years sober, this is a great time to turn yourself in in California and go serve that five years. And sponsors see things different. I'm like, you've lost your mind. Like, what are you talking about? My mother needs me, we, you know, we're simpatico now, she loves me, I take out the trash, I change light bulbs. He's like, why don't you talk to your mother and see what she would have you do? And you know what my mom wanted me to do. She wanted me to be a man of integrity. She wanted me to be the man she raised. I said, well, I got this job going, man. I got this career. He goes, you don't have a career. You sweep the floor. Like pretty much anybody could do that. And I said, well, I got this house and this girlfriend. And, you know, a, 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 somewhere around 18 months, two, three, AA throws in the complimentary AA girlfriend that we think is God's will, right? <laughs> Never works, but we think it is. We tell our sponsors, and our sponsors are like, oh, God. And you're like, this is the one, right? And, and I was dating her. Uh, and she had 16 years sober, so it was definitely going to work, right? Long time AA member. Uh, and, uh, and I'm telling him about that in our house, and we live together, and I can't be going to prison. And, and he goes, she's got 16 years sober. She's got a God. She's got a sponsor. Her life was way better before you came along. And by the way, you don't have a house. You live in a trailer, and you don't own it. You rent it. This is a great time to go to prison, right? And... Uh, <laughs> And I fly out to, he starts confiscating my little bits of my paycheck until I could get a one-way ticket on Southwest out to San Diego. I stand in front of the judge. Um, it was not sexy. I had sweat circles under my arms. I'd been in and out of the bathroom. Any of this business about faith and fear can't be in the same place at the same time. That was not my experience. I had, I had faith that we were going to somehow get through this. Um, and, and the judge said, what are you doing here, right? And I said, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have two years sober. I don't ever want to have to take another drink or a drug, Your Honor. As long as this is hanging over my head, I'm not a free man. This is the last of a thing called the ninth step for me. When I get to put this behind me, I have nothing else hanging over my head. All I want to do is never have to take another drink, so I'm ready to get this sentence started. And what I didn't know is that like 46 or 47 of you had written that judge letters telling him about my life and guys I was sponsoring and floors I was mopping and churches I was opening and big book studies I was doing, you know. And you guys took the time out of your life to write that. And he starts going through these letters. He looks up and he said, uh, by these people, I told you to go to 10 AA meetings. These people say you've been to over 1,000. I've never seen anything like that. You just flew out here on your own nickel to do five years in prison. I, I, I said, I did, Your Honor. I don't ever want to have to drink again. He goes back to the letters. And he finally hits that gavel down. He said, Mr. Bruckner, you have exceeded the terms of the PC-1000 program. You did not complete this probation the way I had asked you to. However, you have greatly exceeded the terms of the program. As far as I'm concerned, this case is closed, and you should return to Maryland and do whatever those people in Alcoholics Anonymous tell you. And he hit that thing down, and it is the first time I've ever walked out of a courtroom. I've walked into a courtroom 36 times. I've gone to a jail cell 36 times, <laughs> right? And my God got a lot bigger that day. And I called my sponsor in the hallway and I said, Raj, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And he goes, well, wait a second. You're not coming home. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. You went out there on a one-way ticket to do five years in prison. You're coming home tomorrow when you buy a ticket, you know, for tomorrow. By the way, what about that college? Remember those Jesuits that you shamed in the newspaper? Aren't they right out there near you? Why don't you clean that up while you're there? And I'm thinking, like, can we celebrate for like one minute? Can we have, celebrate, right? But there's no part of the ninth step that talks about let's pause and celebrate, right? It says action and more action. We keep, and sponsors are like that, right? And uh, so I go over to the University of San Diego. It was the same dean. Her name's Carrie Wilson. And I sit down. It's from nine years earlier. Same dean that kicked me out. 
And I said, hey, Dean, um, my, my name is Rich Bruckner. Thanks for seeing me. I don't know if you know who I am. I used to go to school here. And she said, Rich, we know exactly who you are. We've only had one student in the history of the university go to federal prison. And, uh, <laughs> I said, I don't know how to make this right, but we have a thing called the ninth step. I know what I did. I know now what the Jesuits are from AA. <laughs> AA has kind of encouraged spiritual seeking. I now know what you stand for, building men and women of integrity, education, doing the right thing. I didn't stand for any of that when I went here, and I had no idea what this place stood for, and I humiliated you with my behavior, and I don't know how to make it right but I'm willing to do whatever you tell me to. That's how we end every amends, by the way, in my sponsorship family. I tell you what I did and I ask you how to make it right. We are not so presumptive and arrogant to think that I know how to, see what the step is about, as I understand it, is laying myself spiritually naked at your feet, completely vulnerable and asking how to make it right in your eyes. And she said, if that's true, you will come with me. And took me to a building next door that I'd never been to, put a stack of papers in front of me, said, this is an application to our law school. What you're going to do is fill this out. You're going to go to our law school. It's going to take you three years, but you're a good rememberer. You'll be fine. You never had a problem with the grades. It was the alcohol. And when you graduate, you're going to go on to make us proud. That's how you're going to fix this. And I stepped outside, and I called Roger, and I said, this dean's lost her mind. She wants me to go to law school. If I somehow make it through law school, they're never going to let me take the bar. They're going to run the background check. I'm never going to make it through. There's an ethics section. The ethics committee will never let me practice law. If I make it through the ethics committee, they're never going to issue me. He said, shut up. Shut up. Did you just tell that lady you'd do whatever she said to make it right? I said, yes, sir. And he said, then shut up and fill out the papers. Three years later, I graduated second from the top of my class, because I'm a remember, and, uh, and I'd been through your steps, and the phone rang. And on the other end of the phone was a guy that uh, I knew who he was. He said he was the state's attorney for the state of Maryland. They're the people that locked me up. I don't like them, right? And he said, hold on, I'm patching the call through through the governor's office of crime control and prevention. We just got a large federal grant. I want to hire a state's attorney to head up our gang and narcotics prosecution division. We've been given your name that you know something about the importation of narcotics. And uh, I about fell over. And I accepted that position, and for the next 10 years, I served the state of Maryland. I repeat, served the state of Maryland as the senior state's attorney in charge of narcotics. I went around the state, and from that PC-1000 program, I got to put a drug court in every single county in the state of Maryland and to get it going, and to find a judge that was going to run it, and to find the coordinators, and to find the people in it. And then I had this other little idea that I couldn't sleep at night, and I couldn't sleep at night, and I grabbed somebody smarter than I was, because I'm just a rememberer. And uh, I said, what we got to do is people are dying. And I scratched out this little thing. And that person cleaned it up. The person was a senator. She's brilliant. And she helped clean it up, and it's a little law called the Good Samaritan Law. That if somebody's dying and you call 911, it doesn't matter what's on the coffee table. And when you write a law, I don't know if anybody's here to remember Schoolhouse Rock. I'm just a bill, only a bill, sitting on Capitol Hill. That means you're older than 50, by the way. But anyways, <laughs> uh, if you've got any idea what I just sang, you know. And uh, so I went to Washington, D.C. I testified in front of the con in Congress, in front of the Senate, on this... Uh, law that I got to help write, and I stood on that marble floor on a big eagle. And when you write a law and you're there to testify in front of the Judiciary Committee, you get to bring a guest. Y'all know who I brought, right? My mom. <laughs> she says it was one of the proudest days of her life. And uh, each year I get a little report about how many lives were saved as, as the result of that. I took an early retirement after 10 years and started my own law firm in Ocean City, which was really going out on faith because we had no clients. But I had those two little girls and I wanted to coach their soccer teams and be there after school at 3 o'clock. I didn't want to be a 9 to 5 guy. And let's be honest, I kind of wanted to be the boss, right? And uh, it turns out that what God turned that firm into, I do over 400 DUIs a year. I'm a DUI defense lawyer, which means that over 400 times a year I get to sit across my desk from somebody just like me that looks an awful lot like you, right? And I get to say, you know what? Hey, Keith, I can't help but notice that this is your fourth DUI. Do you think that drinking might have something to do with this, right? And then I get to listen to what the conversation goes to, right? And uh, I believe that God has placed me in a position to be useful each and every other day of my life and he's brought my whole life together that there's nothing called my relationship life right my marriage life my AA life my work life right he's in, so I don't have to live separate lives anymore it's all just one 
and the same thing. And I get to come to places like this and share the greatest thing in my life called Alcoholics Anonymous with you. And uh, we've already heard it said, I promise if you went to my office, I got a whole wall of ego. Trial lawyer awards and this award and that degree and all of that. There is no greater thing that I get to say, that I am prouder to say, than that my name is Rich, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a part of the greatest organization in the world called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I hope each of you feels the same way. Thanks for having me.